I'll give you uh, 50 cents for all this junk. Oh, now, how did this get down Just enter the sheriff. Oh. Nice and easy. Oh, very well. Five dollars. I'm sorry. It's an old family toy. No. Now just walk away. Wait. The other way. I'll, I'll give you 50 bucks for it. 50 bucks ain't bad. <laughs> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Buonasera, signori. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Wow, are you going to do that accent the whole time? No. Oh, good. Volume 2, number 1, page 31. I am your old pal, Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Robot, still beeping. And I'm an Outer Man. Today's story is Book Scouts of the Galactic Rim by Jason Sanford. Jason Sanford's fiction has been published in Year's Best SF14, Interzone, Analog, Science Fiction and Fact, Orson Scott Card's Intergalactic Medicine Show, The Mississippi Review, Diagram, and other places yeah well it was one of those other places the dune steve audio fiction magazine it might have been but it really doesn't deserve a mention oh his stories have won a number of awards and honors including the 2008 inner zone readers poll a minnesota state arts board fellowship and being nominated in the best short fiction category for both the bsfa and british fantasy awards he also co-founded the literary journal Story South, through which he runs the annual Million Writers Award for Best Online Fiction. His website is jasonsanford.com. And a special thanks to Elise Krawick and Abigail Hilton for doing uh, voices on today's show. Thank you, ladies. Book Scouts of the Galactic Rim by Jason Sanford Asimov took Bartholomew Higgins to Vegas, but Heinlein delivered him to Albuquerque. Arthur C. Clarke was supposed to take Bartholomew the rest of the way home for Denise's funeral, but that book fell in a puddle at an Oklahoma gas station. This happened when Bartholomew, Barth, stopped his van at a dimly lit shell station off I-40 shortly after midnight. Barth nervously parked between two massive 18-wheelers, eyeing their drivers with suspicion. He hated truckers. They were unpredictable. To him, the worst of human sins. And too much like the bullies who'd tortured him in high school because of his name and love of science fiction. While his gas pumped, Barth stared at the wind-whipped rain running off the roof. The last time he'd seen Denise, it had also rained, the wind-thrown water impacting the dirt yard around her farmhouse. They'd sat on the front porch of her house, Barth on the porch swing, Denise in her wheelchair, between them a box of books. Denise smiled with excitement over each title and author, for Barth, being near her, turned the acidic decay of the book's paper and glue bindings and the high-water scent of that passing storm into the most wondrous perfume he'd ever smelled. Barth shook his head, trying to ignore the memory. Suddenly, the gas nozzle in his hand slipped and shot out of the gas pipe, spraying gasoline across Barth, the van, and the concrete. Barth wrestled with the nozzle for a second before shoving it back in the van's gas pipe. The two truckers <laughs> laughed at him. Barth finished fueling without looking at them, his eyes watching the expanding gas puddle rainbow the wet cement. And that's how Clark died. When Barth opened the van's rear doors in search of dry clothes, a box of books spilled out. Cheap science fiction paperbacks from the 60s, two brand new copies of the latest Star Trek novel, a handful of young adult fantasies, and a first edition of Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End. Barth cursed, oh, knowing it. only Clarke was worth anything. As if in agreement, the worthless books landed on dry concrete, while Childhood's End bathed in a wind-whipped puddle of rain and gas. Barth snatched the book up, but the damage was done. And that was the end of Barth driving straight to Alabama, the end of fetching $500 for the book from a buyer in Memphis. The end of him being home in time for Denise's funeral. Bartholomew Higgins' online assessment of Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke. Prior to soaking. Valentine Books, 1953. Description. Very good condition. 
unobtrusive signature of a previous owner on the inside cover. To Helena with love. Binding dull, slight wear to extremities. First edition. Slight fading to the title letters on spine. No dust jacket. Barth thought of Denise when he first found Clark at the farm sale outside Cordell, Oklahoma. He'd read about the estate auction in a newspaper at an interstate restaurant. As Barth ate a sausage biscuit, his eyes scanned across the million items in the auction ad, most of which meant little to him. Balzer 2250 Vac Spreader and Agitator. 24 Oft Pats Bunk Feeder 90 Feet. Pats Conveyors. 78 Chev. Livestock Trailer. Lorenz 8-Foot Blower. Household Furniture. Only when scientification books popped up did his heart jump. Barth pulled out his map. The farm was 20 miles away. Lots of back roads. If he found something good, he'd have enough gas money to reach Alabama by Sunday. If not, he'd never get past Mississippi. The farm sat at the end of an incredibly long, straight dirt road, where a few dozen cars parked beside an old farmhouse with paint worn dull by sun and wind. Barth mingled with the farmers inspecting the sale items. Most were old men and women who muttered condemnations or praise at the dead farmer's kids for getting out of the family business. Ignoring their comments, Barth climbed into the bed of a black Chevy stepside where he found the science fiction book stuffed inside a cardboard box. Most were worthless, reprints and worn paperbacks from the 1960s. A few Cold War diatribes from the 1950s, but then he saw Clark. Barth's face twitched as he discreetly pushed the box back to hide it until the bidding. He walked 50 feet away and paced nervously around, trying to appear uninterested, lest someone realize the book's value. To his surprise, the books were number two on the auction list, and he bought them for two dollars. When Barth walked back to the flatbed truck to get the box, he found a short, wiry man holding Clark. Without a word, Barth gently removed the book from the man's hand and took the box. The wiry man glared at him with eyes that appeared glued open with kids' starry time glitter. Even though Clark was ruined, Barth placed the book accordion style over the van's defroster vents. Every ten minutes, he steadied the steering wheel with his knees and turned the page so another spread could dry. The buyer. With one hand, Barth leafed through his notes on the book's buyer. Memphis. The man lived in Memphis. During his travels around the country, Barth checked his email on online book accounts with his laptop. He'd never met this buyer, and didn't know if he had any other books which might interest the man. Not that it mattered. Without being certain of a sell, he couldn't waste money by driving the extra miles to Memphis. The smell of gas filled the van, which irritated Barth. Eventually the gas would dissipate from the paper, but the water was forever. Barth often saw marks in old books or someone had spilled a glass of water while reading The Hobbit, or cried tears over flowers for Algernon. Barth often wished people took better care of their books. That torn, dog-eared first edition of The Sirens of Titan could be worth real money if it had never been read. Barth reached up and turned another page of Clark, resisting the temptation to read a few lines, before he remembered Denise's books in the back of the van. Obviously, she wouldn't need them now. There were some nice first editions there, and if he sold them at a used bookstore, he might make enough gas money to reach Alabama. He hated doing that. Bookstores only paid a few dollars for each book, far less than he could get online. But he needed the money. He turned on the interior light while he drove and looked at the map. The next big city was Little Rock, Arkansas. He knew a used bookstore there, which opened at 11 a.m. Bartholomew Higgins' assessment of Amazing Stories, August 1928. Experimenter Publishing, New York. 95 pages. Description. Color cover for Skylark of Space by E.E. E. Smith, then credited as Edward Elmer Smith. Showing a man in a red jumpsuit flying into a yellow sky. Also includes the first Buck Rogers story. An almost mint condition copy. The pulp paper is fresh as when printed. A truly rare collector's item. The first book Barth gave Denise was a worn first edition of Neuromancer by William Gibson. Barth advertised the book online, and Denise ordered it. Normally, Barth sent orders by book rate mail, but Denise lived only 20 miles from his trailer in central Alabama and, 
after figuring up the cost of driving to her house as opposed to driving to the post office and paying for postage, he decided to deliver the book. He was surprised when an old woman answered the door of the rundown farmhouse. Barth had assumed that Denise was a younger woman. After all, what grandmother reads Gibson? But when he showed her the book, the woman simply muttered, In the library. The library was a 20 by 20 room built onto the house, its floor slanting slightly, so Barth glided to the right with each step he took. No one was in the room, but Barth barely noticed as he caught sight of the library's books. On shelf after shelf sat countless first editions. Robert A. Heinlein's Rocket Ship Galileo, The Star is My Destination by Alfred Bester. But what truly stunned him were the hundreds of vintage copies of Amazing Stories. Barth carefully pulled out an issue from October 1928, featuring the conclusion to Skylark of Space by E.E. E. Smith. On the cover, a robot wrestled a lion to the death beneath a burning red sky. Barth ran his finger along the cracked and crumbling spine, then flipped open the dog-eared pages. To Barth's distaste, handwritten notes covered each page, the note-taker critiquing all aspects of the magazine's stories. Barth glanced down the shelf and figured every copy of Amazing Stories from 1926 through the 1950s sat there. Next to them sat every issue of Astounding Stories and Astounding Science Fiction and Analog Science Fiction from the 1930s through the present. He had never seen a complete run of that series. Even in this collection's poor shape, the magazines were worth tens of thousands of dollars. Those early amazing cover paintings are unbelievable, a voice behind him said. Even when the stories inside are crap, Frank Paul's covers redeem everything. Barth turned to find a middle-aged woman in a wheelchair watching him. Because of the tilt of the floor, the woman kept one hand on the left wheel at all times, so her wheelchair wouldn't roll to the right. Barth introduced himself, and asking if she was Denise, handed her the book she'd ordered. The woman thanked him and pointed at the magazine Barth held. Have you read any of Claire Winger Harris's work? She asked. Barth glanced at the magazine's cover, and sure enough, Harris's name was listed as one of the contributors. He'd never heard of her and said so, commenting that there were far too many science fiction authors whose names had disappeared from history. That's a shame, Denise said. Harris wrote so movingly about what it means to be human. I must have reread her stories in those early amazings at least a hundred times. It took a moment for Barth to understand that Denise was the one who'd torn up these magazines. Barely able to contain his anger, he explained that these amazing and astounding collections, if in good condition, were worth a lot of money. Denise waved for him to lower his voice. My mother may be old, she whispered, but she's got good ears. Barth looked around the house and imagined what tens of thousands of dollars could do here. He doubted that the house was worth that much money. As if knowing his thoughts... Denise said her mother knew some of the books were valuable, but that didn't mean they should rub her nose in this fact. Barth smiled when Denise looked through her new book. He expected her to place it on one of her empty bookshelves, but instead she dropped it roughly into a box on the floor. That was when he learned that she didn't place any book on her bookshelf until she had read it completely, made notes in it, and sometimes reread it a dozen times. Barth asked why she didn't just read library books or paperbacks, especially if she was going to tear them up. First editions were expensive. Denise shook her head at Barth for missing such an important point. Imagine the excitement these writers felt when their book was first published, she said. That's the feeling I'm also going for. Excitement. Barth smiled. He liked Denise, even if he vehemently disagreed with her views on book collecting. Barth reached Little Rock by 8 a.m. Because the bookstore wouldn't open for a few hours, he drove to the east side of town to a Goodwill store that sometimes held good books in its discount bins. When Barth arrived, a small crowd of women stood by the front door. He joined them, ignoring the screaming babies and toddlers pulling at their mother's hands. When the doors opened, the crowd poured toward the clothing section, while Barth walked calmly toward the books and magazines in the back. To Barth's surprise, he wasn't alone the same wiry man he'd snatched the Clark book from at the estate auction was inspecting the book bins. The man glared at him with glued open glitter eyes before returning to the books. For a moment, Barth thought about complaining to the manager about the man getting into the store early, but that would yield only lost time. So Barth walked to one of the bins the man had yet to inspect and began browsing the titles. Before Barth were multiple copies of bestsellers by Clancy, Grisham, and Rice, along with endless mid-list books which no one read when they first came out, but which now appeared in every second-hand store in the country. As he often did, 
Barth wondered if there was a mathematical equation to explain why certain books appeared over and over again in discount bins. Barth glanced at the wiry man, who held a nice hardcover of Space by James A. Michener, which he placed in a shopping basket. Barth guessed it must be a first edition. Barth didn't know the man, but that proved nothing. Barth had only met a few of his fellow book scouts, those solitary, suspicious little men and women who traveled the country in search of books and looked on their fellow book buyers as competitors, trying to steal treasures out from under them. Sighing, Barth returned to the books. He found a first edition of a recent Stephen King novel. Not a big deal, but worth $20. When Barth placed the book in his basket, the wiry man smirked at him for choosing such a small prize. The man then picked up a Michael Crichton novel and wavered as if debating whether to take it after mocking Barth. The man placed the book back in the bin, as if daring Barth to lower himself by touching the title. Barth moved to another bin. These were all textbooks and National Geographics, which were a waste of time to look through. Irritated, he glanced at the books in the wiry man's bin, where a battered copy of The Conquest of Space winked at him. Barth's heart jumped. The book looked to be the first edition from 1949. Not only was it worth a decent bit of money, it was among the list of titles Denise had been searching for all her life. Barth focused his gaze down at his own books. The wiry man had already looked over Conquest of Space and discounted it. Barth was tempted to simply walk over and take it. But there was an etiquette to these things, and snatching a book from under someone's nose was unseemly. Barth pretended that the book didn't matter, that it was nothing, less than nothing, and waited for the man to finish looking at the bin and walk away. But in what must be craziness, time slowed down as the man now paused over each science fiction book in the bin for minutes, for hours. The man turned each book left and right in his hand, smelled the binding, held the cover to his forehead as if reading it telepathically. Not wanting to show irritation, but also wanting to stay close to snatch the Conquest of Space book when the man left, Barth moved back to the bin of National Geographics and thumbed through the worthless issues. He recognized one issue from the early 1960s, which he liked as a teenager because of the shirtless native women. Now the women looked antique and young at the same time, like he was watching a 50-year-old porno movie starring his grandmother. Barth glanced at his watch. Bookstores were most generous if approached first thing in the morning, and Barth would have to leave soon. But that book. He needed that book. The man kept inspecting the bin, book after book, while the only valuable item in the place sat unnoticed. Finally, the wiry man straightened up and nodded to Barth. Then, as he walked away, the man absently reached out and grabbed the conquest of space. At the checkout counter, Barth watched sadly as the man bought it for 50 cents. A few days after meeting Denise, Barth began to dream. Deep dreams. Dreams wrapped around all the science fiction books he'd read during his life. One night, he walked to the ring world. The next, he jaunted across the solar system. Each day, he woke from another forgotten story and raced to his bookshelf, where he immersed himself in a science fiction book he hadn't read in ages. The only constant among these dreams, aside from science fiction, was that Barth always woke with the feeling that Denise had been standing beside him all night holding his hand. When these dreams entered their second week, he knew he had to talk to Denise. Afraid to sound like a wacko, he called and said he had some new science fiction books she might be interested in. Denise said to come over. Barth parked in Denise's driveway, where he sat for a moment watching Denise's father plow a tiny vegetable garden with a ridiculously massive old tractor. When Denise rolled down the rickety handicap ramp to greet him, Barth handed her the box of books. She examined each one carefully, nodding at the titles, muttering how she'd been looking for a few of them. But in the end, she wouldn't take them. Why? They're not first editions, Denise said. Barth wanted to scream. He again repeated that first editions were expensive, and besides, Denise would merely write all over them. But Denise was adamant, wheeling back a few feet to glare at him. Do you know what's wrong with me? She asked. I have cystic fibrosis. I shouldn't have lived past 30. Now I'm 40. Once a week, a nurse visits me. I take a dozen pills with each meal. Several times a day, I put on a mechanical vest which pounds my chest to loosen the mucus in my lungs so I can breathe. Barth said he didn't see what that had to do with the books. Denise threw her arms up in exasperation. This farm has belonged to four generations of my family. When I was born, my parents could have taken the easy way out and put me in a home. Instead, they refused charity and sold off land to pay my medical bills. 
40 years of doing what's best for me. All we own now is what you see. My dad used to plow hundreds of acres. Now he plows a garden not much bigger than his tractor. Barth still didn't know what any of this had to do with Denise's books, but instead of saying that, he muttered that he understood. In response, Denise handed Barth a list of first editions she was looking for. As Barth placed his box of books back in the van, he asked Denise if she ever dreamed about the science fiction stories she'd read. Her eyes lit up, and she grabbed his hand, which jumped his heart into his throat. I'm always dreaming, she said. Don't you? Barth nodded sheepishly, causing Denise to squeeze his hand tight. Then you do understand. Barth nodded again, even though he still didn't have a clue what he was nodding to. When Barth pulled into the parking lot of the Little Rock bookstore, he noticed the wiry man waiting at the front door. Barth picked up Denise's box of books and joined the man. It was now 11.05. The bookstore should have opened already. The wiry man rested a box of books at his feet and stared through the bookstore's glass door with his weird eyes. Barth glanced at the man's box of books, on top of which lay Conquest of Space. Feeling awkward at standing next to someone without acknowledging him, Barth remarked that the man would get a better price for the book if he sold it online. This is known, the man said in a low, monotone voice without looking away from the glass. Feeling that he hadn't gotten his point across, Barth told the man that the owner of this bookstore was extremely cheap. Barth said the space book would probably fetch $60 online. This is known, the man repeated and glared at Barth. His eyes sparkled like shattered glass on asphalt. Barth turned so he didn't have to look at the man. They waited for 40 minutes before the owner opened the door without even apologizing for being late. Even though Barth was in a hurry to get back on the road, to be polite, he let the wiry man go first. The owner picked through the man's box, selecting one book, discarding another, opening a third to the CIP page to check the edition. The owner sorted the books into different piles, each based on how much he would pay. The conquest of space went into the $4 pile. However, when the owner was finished sorting, the wiry man refused to accept the money and said he'd only take payment in trade. The wiry man then walked to the store's science fiction section and returned with several books. The owner looked through the books and nodded, and the wiry man left without meeting Barth's gaze. It was now Barth's turn. Yet again, the owner sorted the books. Yet again, he offered much less than any fair price for the books, and once or twice, Barth debated, causing the man to offer a dollar more. Barth's goal was to get at least $50 for gas and food. The owner only offered 40 and Barth hoped that it would be enough to get him home. When the owner walked to the register for the money, Barth stared at the conquest of space, bought for 50 cents, sold for $4, worth at least 60 and sought by Denise all her life. With the owner looking the other way, Barth snatched the book and placed it among his own rejected titles. He then thanked the bookstore owner for the money and drove as fast as he could out of Little Rock. Barth continued to dream in the weeks after visiting Denise. He patrolled the galaxy as a lensman, lived on an integral tree orbiting a hazy sun, rode a sandworm across the deserts of Arrakis. The only constant in all these dreams was Denise standing beside him, holding his hand. Thinking that he needed to clear his head, Barth loaded up his van with supplies and books and set out for the flea markets along the Gulf Coast. Two decades ago, when Barth first began buying and selling books, he traveled continually to different flea markets around the country. Now, the internet let everyone not only discover the value of books, but order whatever they wanted when they wanted. He knew the days of driving cross-country in search of books would soon be over, but he refused to give in. After saying goodbye to Denise, Barth drove to the Gulf Shores and rented a booth at a local flea market. Every day he sold tons of bestsellers, trashy romance novels, and cheaply plotted detective novels to sunburned tourists who gushed over finding the perfect book. Like the two elderly sisters from Canada who bought matching paperback editions of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone so they could read the book at the same time and talk about Harry over dinner. One of the old ladies even kissed Barth upon finding the books, and Barth's cheek burned for the rest of that day from her touch. Despite his travels, though, the science fiction dreams continued. After selling off most of his books, Barth returned home. The next day, he visited Denise. 
Four books, he said, handing them to Denise. Can't believe I found them, but first edition's all. They sat in Denise's den as she looked at the books. The first two books, Stand on Zanzibar by John Brunner and Lord of Light by Roger Zelazny, would have been somewhat valuable, except they came from a library sale in Fort Walton. Both had library copies stamped across the pages and a glued checkout pocket on the inside back cover. The other books, The Integral Trees by Larry Niven and Rendezvous with Rama by Arthur C. Clarke, simply weren't that rare. They're not in the best of shape, Denise said. They're the best I could find, Barth replied, pulling out the handwritten list of more than 50 books Denise wanted. I'll find more next time I go out. Denise thanked him for looking. She then invited him to join her in the den. For the rest of the afternoon, they talked about Barth's trip along the Gulf Coast and the people he met at the different flea markets. Denise was fascinated by the two elderly sisters and wondered why the sister's kiss burned Barth's cheek. I'm not sure, Barth said. Maybe the sister was really hot in her younger years and my body responded to that on a subconscious level? Denise chuckled. <laughs> As afternoon went to evening, Barth finally said he should be going. He yearned to ask Denise about the dreams, but still didn't want her to think him crazy. However, as he stood up, Denise's mother came into the den and notified him, as if he lacked all choice in the matter, that he would be staying for supper. Barth considered his usual TV dinner meals alone in his trailer and agreed. At the table, between passing the potatoes to her mother and pouring gravy over a roast beef, Denise pulled out her first edition copy of Stand on Zanzibar from a wheelchair pocket. Barth watched in despair as gravy dribbled across the book's cover. Denise, however, ignored the stains and proceeded to read from a random page. But the Guinevere's of our world are no more than the spray on the top of the wave, she read. Barth listened to the story as if it were totally new, not one he had read before. But the Guinevere's, he thought, knowing people like Guinevere were the ones who'd made fun of him all his life. When Denise finished reading the chapter, she reached over and squeezed Barth's hand. Denise's parents thanked her for the story and told Barth that Denise read to them every night over supper. Later, when her mother went to clean the dishes and her father to check on his garden, Barth thanked her. I've never liked that book, he said. It was too strange, I guess. But not when you read it. You're an ignorant idiot, Denise said with a smile, quoting from the book. Lean over. Barth did as told, and Denise kissed him on the cheek. Does it burn like that old lady's kiss? She asked. Barth admitted that it burned even better than that. Bartholomew Higgins' unpublished assessment of The Conquest of Space by Leigh Willey. Paintings by Chester Bonestell. New York, New York. Viking Press, 1949, VG slash G, first edition. Description. A reasonably clean first edition copy. Book contains vivid descriptions of humanity's coming great adventure as we step into space and embrace our species' destiny. The keystone of this book are the wondrous paintings by Bonestell. Definitely makes one dream of other planets and the future. Powerful. Barth was certain he'd make it home in time for Denise's funeral on Sunday afternoon. But then his van died. The Dodge tradesman was 30 years old, and the only reason Barth had kept it was because he could usually fix the van's simple engine with ease. But this time, when he stopped at a rest stop to use the restroom, he walked back out to find the van was absolutely dead. Must be electrical, he thought. He spent the next three hours detaching, cleaning, and reattaching wires and spark plugs and battery terminals until his flashlight also died. A trucker tried to help him jump the battery, but the battery wasn't dead, and the trucker said the problem must be in the electrical system. Barth resisted, saying, No shit. Because comments like that had gotten him beat up over the years. That night, Barth slept in his van and dreamed of worlds painted by Chesley Bonestell, with sharp metal rockets surrounded by steep, craggy mountains and Saturn rising in the east. When morning came, Barth again worked on his van, spreading out under the hood with his tools and trying different ways to make electricity go from the battery to his engine. Several truckers came by as he did this. One had a voltmeter in his cab, which proved unable to pinpoint where the fault lay in the miles of wiring making up the van's electrical system. That's an old van, the voltmeter trucker said. Probably not worth putting money into it. Yeah, Barth said, so irritated that he didn't mind talking to a trucker. He didn't bother mentioning that he didn't have the money to fix the van. 
even if the van had been worth putting money into. Before the trucker left, he looked in the back of Barth's van. You selling those books? He asked. The voltmeter trucker purchased $10 worth of science fiction books. For the rest of Saturday, and again into Sunday morning, Barth discreetly sold his books. Whenever he saw a state trooper pull into the rest stop, Barth pretended to be repairing his van. Otherwise, he approached everyone he saw. To his astonishment, many of the truckers were receptive to mysteries and military thrillers and, most surprising of all, romance novels. He also sold a lot of children's books to harried parents. Barth put from his mind how much the books were worth if he sold them online, to a bookstore, or even at a flea market. People only cared that they were 50 cents each, or three for a dollar. By two on Sunday afternoon, the exact time that he knew Denise's funeral started, Barth had earned almost $150. However, he ran out of time later that day when a state trooper told him that he'd have to move the van or have it impounded. Barth thanked the trooper and sold him the Stephen King novel he'd found at Goodwill for $3. Once evening came, Barth counted his money. Just over $200. He might be able to find a mechanic to repair the van for that amount, but with towing and parts charges, there was no way he could afford to fix the thing. Besides, the van wasn't worth it. Barth ate a final meal from the cooler in the back of the van, then sorted through the hundreds of remaining books. A few of them were valuable, and he packed them into a small box that he could carry. On top of the box, he placed the Conquest of Space. He then removed the license plate from his van so the troopers couldn't track it back to him. Then, when the rest area was deserted, he picked up Clark's gas-soaked childhood's end and lit it with a match. The book caught fast, and Barth dropped it onto a paperback reprint of Fahrenheit 451. The fire quickly spread to the other books, and by the time the next 18-wheeler pulled into the rest area, the van jumped flames to the sky. Electrical fire, Barth told the trucker. Finally fix the damn thing, and it catches fire when I start the engine. The trucker nodded in sympathy. Need a lift? Barth reached his trailer in central Alabama after two days of hitchhiking and walking. He dropped the box of books on his dinner table and tried to call Denise's parents, but a recorded message said the number had been disconnected. Exhausted, he collapsed into bed. The next day, Barth called a few more times, but the number was always disconnected. He also checked his website, where he found a backlog of orders. Some were for books he'd lost in the van. The rest he placed in padded envelopes for mailing. Barth bought a second-hand minivan from a cousin, then used the little money he had left to mail the books people had ordered and fill the minivan with gas. That afternoon, storm clouds blew in. Deciding the time was right, he grabbed an umbrella and the conquest of space and drove to Denise's house. He arrived to find dozens of cars parked out front. A large sign by the mailbox read, Estate Sale. Barth walked around, still holding the space book, until he'd found Denise's parents standing under an umbrella in their garden. They leaned against the massive old tractor, which also had a for sale sign on it. My extreme sympathy... Barth said. Both parents hugged him as he explained why he hadn't made the funeral. They nodded, understanding, and said that they were moving once everything sold. We wouldn't want to be staying, Denise's mother said. Couldn't afford to, anyway. Barth tried to explain how much Denise meant to him. How even after her death, he still felt her hand holding his each night. However, even as he said that, he realized how crazy his words still sounded. So he again offered his sympathies, then walked to the house. Inside, a small crowd of people with scavenger eyes milled around, inspecting plates and furniture and clothes. Barth saw Denise's wheelchair with a price tag of $30 on it and shook his head. However, despite all the people in the house, only one person stood in the library. The wiry man. Barth was no longer surprised at the man's appearance and simply said hello. The wiry man glared angrily at Barth a look that turned even more hostile when he saw the conquest of space in Barth's hands. Barth tried to ignore the man, and instead focused on Denise's books, wondering about the dreams this room had given her. He ran his fingers along the titles, remembering books he'd read, others he'd wished to read. He opened the copy of Stand on Zanzibar he'd given her, the page Denise had read that night at supper. But the Guinevere's of our world are no more than the spray on the top of the wave, was dog-eared. In the margin, Denise had written, I'm not a Guinevere, neither's Barth. That'll save the world. Barth ran his fingers along Denise's words. 
Suddenly, he felt himself in the book's story, struggling for identity in a media-saturated world, trying to find his dreams among the overloaded stimulus of billions of uncountable people. But despite being lost in the world, Barth also knew that Denise was right. His dreams were the waves. His dreams crashed forward and reshaped the world and... Barth snapped out of it, losing his balance on the library's uneven floor and falling down. The wiry man stared at him with glitter glue eyes, a happy smile on his face. The man then pulled a worn copy of astounding science fiction off of the shelf. Suddenly, Barth stood on Lake Ash, a planet surrounded by six suns. He'd never known darkness, never known anything but endless light. But as the sun set for the first time in 2,000 years, darkness enveloped the world, and starlight flooded Barth's eyes. And he was afraid, deeply afraid. Barth came back to the library with a start. The wiry man laughed as he pulled another book off the shelf. This time, Barth found himself in a generation ship, hurtling toward the stars. The wiry man then grabbed an issue of Amazing Stories, and Barth was Buck, Anthony Rogers, fighting against Armageddon in 2419 AD. Next, Barth was a child with superpowers, granted anything he wished for. Then he was adrift in a spacesuit, dying alone to his thoughts. Then he was living in the last city on Earth, a billion years in the future. Just as Barth felt himself becoming lost in the stories, Denise's hand grabbed him. She led him from the library, where he collapsed onto the hallway floor, clutching her copy of Stand on Zanzibar in a death grip to his chest. An older woman, who was inspecting Denise's wheelchair, asked if Barth was okay. Barth nodded and sat with his head between his knees, crying. Once he'd recovered, Barth watched from the doorway as the wiry man took down the entire collection of amazing stories and astounding science fiction and placed them into boxes. Barth wondered if he'd been feeling Denise's dreams, or the wiry man's, or both. Unsure, Barth walked to the cashier's table and, with his last three dollars, purchased Stand on Zanzibar. He then walked outside and sat on the front porch swing. He waited as the rain alternated between picking up and slacking off, the clouds moving in and out of the sky. The wiry man emerged an hour later with the first of his boxes. Barth watched in amusement as the man stumbled through a puddle, then turned back to the front porch when a wind gust blew rain over him and the books. The man tried to cover the box with his raincoat, but the box was too big. Barth sighed and, grabbing his umbrella, hurried to help the man. Find some good books? Barth asked. This is known, the man said suspiciously. Barth held his umbrella over the man in his box, but it took a moment for the man to decide to go with him. They walked quickly, sloshing through puddles. When they reached the wiry man's station wagon, the man balanced the box on his hip as he unlocked the rear door. But just as the door opened, the wiry man dropped the box. The book splashed into the muddy puddle beneath the car. The wiry man grabbed the box and the books still inside and shoved them into the station wagon while Barth grabbed at the spilled books. Barth picked up a disintegrating copy of Amazing Stories, then other books, then more magazines. He tossed them into the station wagon, pages opening to random spots so he briefly saw unknown comments in Denise's handwriting, comments that faded and disappeared to the spreading water stains. The wiry man cried as he grabbed a towel from the station wagon and tried to blot the water from the soaked pages. Barth placed the last of the books in the back of the station wagon, then stood with his umbrella protecting the wiry man. Endless comments from Denise passed by as the pages fanned and moved to the man's towel. Barth watched simply holding the umbrella. He saw Denise kissing him on the cheek, saw the dreams he'd had every night since first meeting Denise, knew her dreams lived on, knew they mattered more than the Guinevere's in the world could ever imagine. As the wiry man cried over the books, being careful not to get his tears on the paper, Barth almost mentioned that kisses burned even after the kiss, that they burned despite being nothing but skin and water coming into contact with skin and dreams. But that comment was for Denise alone. So Barth stood quietly in the rain as he dreamed of her hand holding his. Author's Authors Note Book Scouts of the Galactic Rim was originally published in the online magazine Menda City Review. 
Jason wrote the story in a fit of melancholy, brought on by the death of a close friend, who had shared a love of science fiction. As Jason told us, the simple truth is everyone dies, and all you can hope for is that each person leaves something behind for others to cherish and love once they are gone. In the case of Book Scouts, what is left behind is a love of stories, the dreams those stories enabled, and one special friend who shared those dreams. Welcome back. Hope you had a good ride and enjoy the rest of your stay here at Great America. August 30th has passed, so in case uh, anybody wanted to enter our movie quote contest, the deadline has passed. And we'll let you know next week on the next episode just who exactly did win that illustrious title. Hey, so in the end, a couple of people did enter, and I appreciate that. And I hope that you guys had fun. If you did, then it was worth it. That's the whole point of our whining session last week, <laughs> was that we thought it was fun. Play the sad music. No, 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 don't play it. It's. It, I'm not whining right now. Oh. We thought it was fun. And to me, that was enough. And so if other people thought it was fun too, then cool, maybe we'll do another one in the future. Good on you. Uh, but You know, with a title like Book Scouts of the Galactic Rim, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was that this was going to be some kind of throwback to Buck Rogers. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, that kind of pulp right. science fiction, you know, that, that bygone era when science fiction was fun. <laughs> but uh, actually, we got something much more profound out of it. You know, this is our second Jason Sanford story. Yeah. Although we did also read a Jason Sanford story for Starship Sofa, which would make it our third and yeah, you know, I almost feel like I know Jason Sanford. Like he's one of those repeat guys. Repeat offenders. Oh, can we call him that from now on? <laughs> I think anyone who comes on the Dune Steve podcast is a offender. But you know what? Jason didn't actually send us this story. He didn't actually send us any story. <laughs> <laughs> we begged him, didn't we? Yeah, I, I begged him after we did that. It might even have been the same night that you <laughs> and I read When Thorns Are the Tips of Trees, which we did in Starship Sofa. In... It was back in May. In May, okay. It seems like a lot longer ago. <laughs> but uh, the, I think the well, night that you and I recorded that, I sent Jason an email. It, just because, you know, every once in a while a story comes along and it just grabs your imagination or it grabs hold of you and takes you to some place that you've never been before. You know, lots of times you read a story and you enjoy it or you read a story and, and you don't feel something one way or another or, or you frankly just forget. But with that one, it was just like, wow, I felt like I had been transported, like I had gone – like you said a second <laughs> ago, the roller coaster had ended or not the roller coaster, but the tour or bus had finally stopped and everybody get up and he's like, wow, think about where you just went. And so I sent him an email and told him how much I liked it and asked if, if maybe he had a story that we could do. And he sent three. The first one that we did for the show was the one that we mispronounced the name of. Yeah. It was Free Langa. That was what that story was. It was. And, and I think he said it Free Langa, though. But, you know. What could we do? You know what I mean? We had re read the story. And I remember at the very beginning, there were a couple of alien words, including the title. And you and I just sort of had to decide yeah. how we were going to pronounce them and then ask the people that participated in the reading to pronounce them in the same way. Right. And we we had like a 50-50 chance and we got it wrong on both cases. Yeah, but you know, at least we said it the same way every time. Could have been worse. That's what you've got to do. Yeah. I recently did a, a reading of a couple of Robert E. Howard's stories about Conan the Barbarian. And in editing them, I realized that sometimes I called him Conan and sometimes I called him Conan. And I was like, that sucked so much because it's just me. And I couldn't keep it straight. Believe Conan O'Brien, the barbarian. But anyhow, Jason was kind enough to say, not only can you do one of these three, you can do these three stories. And you and I both read them and they were all good. Yeah. And it was just a matter of what did we think would translate the best to audio so we chose Fre Frelanja. And then next up here was... Uh, it's, it's actually pronounced Frylanja. Nice oh, try. I can't get anything right. No wonder we didn't get a Parsec nomination. <laughs> <laughs> no one loves <laughs> Okay, well, while Rish is weeping back there in the corner and holding himself and 
rocking back and forth piteously. But I'm going to go ahead and continue on with the show. Uh, again, we'd like to thank Jason Sanford for letting us use his stories. They're amazing stories, and uh, probably a few months in the future we'll have a third. Unless um, we completely this one up. Yeah. So thanks, Jason, for that story. It's good stuff. I remember when we read the first three stories, I, I, I guessed that this would be the story that you would like the most. And I figured because of, like, the things that you have in common with it. You know, this this is about a guy who goes out, tries to find rare books, finds treasures amid the pile of dung that he has to search through to dust them off and sells them to people for lots of money. There was a, a long period of time where both Rish and I were doing basically the same thing. We were selling things on eBay, but we didn't sell books. It was actually action figures. And we had a great time traveling around the uh, area to every freaking Walmart in search of that rare figure that I can buy for seven bucks but sell for 20 you're totally right. This story really resonated with me on that exact same level. I remember the agony of ruining something that otherwise would be worth some. Didn't you once, just for the heck of it, you know, your your niece was over playing in your house and you're like, here, why don't you play with some of these figures that I'm going to sell? And she plays with it for a while and then she comes back and goes, hey, this happened and she hands you the figure and its head was broken off. I think the arms it was that had broken <laughs> off, but... Oh, well, I, yeah, that sucker is worth so much right now. Anyhow, you know, when I lived in L.A. and I had no money at all, I would go down to Oceanside, California, and my uncle had a beach house there. And Oceanside is right by a marine base. It's Camp Pendleton, right? And the marines, when they ship out, have to just get rid of all of their stuff. And so they would take their CDs and their DVDs and their electronics and their books, the probably coloring books, knowing marines, uh, to the local pawn shop, and they would just have to dump them there, and then they get shipped off to go die for our country. And, and you would swoop in <laughs> like a vulture and well, I, feed on that carcass. I would, because there would be such good things. And the, the local Goodwill just had shelves and shelves of books, and you'd find, like, really nice first edition books and stuff, you know, that were brand new and never got read. So yeah, I, I would grab them and bring them back and, and sell them. And I'm sure that fed me several times. You got so I understood one that. Big Mac meal out of that. I know I did. Wow. Yeah. So, so even the book thing resonated with me. And boy, I, I my whole life have been a comic book fan. Mm -hmm. And my uncle will always tell these stories about how he had Fantastic Four number one and Incredible Hulk number one and all this stuff when he was a kid. And when he went off to high school or army or college or whatever it was, his, his mother just tossed him Threw or him gave out. him to the neighbor kids or whatever. And, and you'll hear these stories of there's an old lady and she has a big chest from up in the attic and right. she has a yard sale and she opens up the chest and it's full of action comics, one, two, three, four, five, and six or whatever. <laughs> a guy says, I'll give you $20 for him. I'll and she's give like, you five bucks for all this junk. Yeah, that's right. And she's like, oh, four is fine. And he's like, ha, 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 ha. And he goes and he buys a house. You know what this story really reminded me a lot of is Cory Doctorow's story, Crap Hound, which is a little different because this guy's cruising around thrift shops and yard sales with an alien. But yeah, they come across the same kind of thing. They uh, find treasures just out in the middle of nowhere and they find a bunch of old cowboy costumes or something. It's, it's just that same kind of thing. Um, it's like Al, you know, finding that Woody doll that he's been looking for for years. Of course, he steals it, but it's kind of cool, that general idea of being able to find something that people don't value and then turn it around and find the person that does value it and sell it to them for a hundred times what you bought it for. What was so rad about the Crap Hound story was that the alien was only interested in things that had great sentimental value to people. And the human character that is easy to identify with is only interested in things that have monetary value. That is like, oh, you could get eight right. bucks for this. And he's like, oh, I'm not interested in that because nobody ever loved that. It's funny. I, that, that story really stayed with me too, the Crap Hound one, to the point where uh, I got an anthology of Cory Doctorow's stories and I never, ever even cracked it. <laughs> this would normally be a line that we would cut out. But the reason I'm mentioning this is there were so many references to writers and sci-fi authors and, and stories of yesteryear and the power and resonance and beauty in these stories in Book Scouts 
that it made me want to go out and read some of these authors that I'd never read or read some of these authors that, that are gone, that are forgotten now. And yeah, me too. I mean, I was never a big reader growing up. What, what, didn't you read Lord of the Rings in high school? <laughs> I was having sex in high school. Ah. We would have the assignment to read the book and do the report and you'd get like a month or two months to do this. And the last day I would start the book. And I'd be there like laying in my room trying to read this thing all the way through the Sunday before the report is due Monday morning. I just didn't read a lot. I've, and seeing all these references to all these books that I've heard a lot about, but a lot of them I haven't read or I, I don't know. It makes me seriously want to go out and raid the library if my library was likely to have any of them. I wish I had more time. I wish... I could afford audible.com or something and be able to just get a ton of audiobooks because I have so much time to listen to things sitting in my car and on no time at all to be able to actually sit down and read, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I ought to read a lot more. There's a lot of things I ought to do more. <laughs> but reading is one of the things that I love, and yet I don't do it. And, I, you know, I was talking to our... I was talking to your friend, Abby Hilton, the other night, and she was talking about that, that she knows books, and I know movies, and our knowledge doesn't really overlap all that much. And I, I guess I've sort of picked my side, and my side is movies, and I love movies, and I, you know, I make an active effort to go out and see movies. Right. And if I missed it, I, I try and get it on Netflix or whatever it might be. But you know, it's it's more difficult for me with the books thing. Books take longer. Right. Books they do require some actual effort. But you do make a, a serious effort with movies, though. I mean, you were telling me how you see one film that isn't an American film, some foreign film of one stripe or another how often do you do that once a month once a year once every six months once i don't know we got a kurosawa film like a month and a half ago and, and i think i'm done for a while <laughs> and you also told me that you try and make an effort to see classic films as well all the time yeah all and, the time and even that is work i guess <laughs> and, and it I depends I on the that. classic film it's interesting there's a lot of amazing literature films music etc out there some people were talking at work the other day about, I guess there's some news story or something like that that came out that said the generation gap is the smallest it's ever been. Children don't feel like their parents are old fuddy-duddies and that they don't know anything anymore. Wow, these, really? These days, parents and children like hang out together, listen to the same music, and if anything, kids think their parents are cooler than they are now. But children are such shit in this generation. <laughs> Apparently, that's what a lot of people came up with was the uh, idea is that there's just nothing of worth that's new coming out. I mean, you've got like your Fallout Boy or you've got your Hannah Montana or your Jonas Brothers. And I don't know. The, the pop music scene seems to be less vibrant than it has been in the past and and apparently this is causing the kids today to go and actually seek out classic rock and stuff like that earlier than you know they used to when when i was a kid you know i, I mean shoot you've told me there's all sorts of classic rock songs that you never ever heard until you were past college past the time that you should have definitely known it by then but at yet the same time my niece is eight years old and she knows so many 80 songs and she yeah, just yeah that's you what know, i'm saying like, oh, make me a cd of more 80 songs and stuff what like i'm that. saying yeah everybody these days they realize that the classic music is more worthwhile than the newer stuff that's coming out i guess I asked a friend of mine, his kid was uh, over at our house the other day, and I was like, what's your favorite band? And he says, uh, Led Zeppelin, ACDC, Foo Fighters. And I just thought, really? How old is this kid? He's, he's 11. That was the stuff he liked, was all the classic rock and roll stuff, I guess. Uh, it's something that seems to have more permanence or something to it, I don't know. And it's the same kind of thing. There's so many things out there that are classic like that, that people should experience and get that chance to see. And this story just really uh, goes along with that. You know, it's hard to make time to read. And, and if you do have the time set aside, it's hard to take a, a chance on somebody that you don't know or a, a story that hasn't been made into a movie, at least in my <laughs> case, you know what I mean? Where I don't know exactly what I was getting. When I was a kid, I would always read novelizations to movies and stuff like that because right. it was just... That was my favorite book growing up was the Return of the Jedi novelization. <sighs> I used to go through there and look for character names. Hey, I don't think they've made a figure of this guy. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know. 
you know, in the era of podcasts, I've heard so many new short stories that I never would have heard. And just in us doing the Dune Steef, I would never have read any of these stories. I mean, even the bad ones that people send, there have been times when somebody has sent us a story and I'm like, eh. But, you know, that gives me an idea for a story. And then you steal that guy's idea mercilessly. Okay, I haven't done that yet, but I will. <laughs> it's, it's weird. There's only so many hours in the day, but I want to be better read. And, uh, yeah, you know, I have a friend who's seen so many movies that it just makes me look like a Mennonite. <laughs> and he'll talk about the body of work of Eddie Deason, and I'll be like, ah... And then I have a friend who's absolutely the most literary person in the world. And he has thousands of books and he will read a couple books a, a week. My mom reads three or four books a week. And then I know people that are super into music and they can tell you who sings anything. And, and, you know, I try to be a Renaissance man and know a little bit about all this stuff, be able to converse in some party that I will never actually go to with people about a number of subjects. But you know what? There are too many subjects out there. Yeah. Like art. I'll never know anything about art. Yeah, you or... can't know everything about everything. No, you can't. But it is interesting when somebody will write a great story like Jason has, and it just reminds you why there are people that love stories. Yeah. I, I guess more than a reader, I'm a writer. And it makes me want to be able to write something that affects someone the way that he affected me. I, I'm trying to think of the, the highest, the, the, the greatest compliment that anybody ever gave me about my writing. And I guess it would be that my friend Jeff got on a plane and he had like a three hour plane ride and I gave him a story of mine. And when he got home, he called me and he said, I cried. Oh. That big, has anybody ever said anything that just wowed you? Do, do people use wow as a verb anymore? Yeah, nobody uses that anymore, do they? <laughs> Anything that just floored you about one of your own stories? I don't think so. I don't think anybody likes my stories. All right, OT. You know what to do. <laughs> People have said they're good and stuff, but nobody's ever said that they cried or anything like that, I'm afraid. I guess I'm still waiting for that uh, comment to come. I've only written like four stories in my life anyway, so... Okay. I guess you do have to put some effort into it. I guess there's a reason we only have one listener. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Let's just sort of call this episode over. Um, we'll play with a Comic-Con conversation we had like a month ago, and maybe uh, it'll give you some time to write another story, to write a fifth story, one that will make people cry or wipe themselves. Oh, all right. Okay. That's a good idea. Uh, oh, wait, OT, can you play that? Well... How long has it been since we've done an episode? There's got to be a gap in there somewhere, right? Because I was gone for five minutes and you were gone for <laughs> a greater part of a month. Uh -huh. And uh, we're just barely. This is the first time I've seen you since, uh, I think, since Carter was president, actually. Yeah, I think that's about right. I wanted to find out from you how Comic-Con was. You've been home from it now for weeks already. I guess everybody probably who cares has already discovered any interesting, cool things that happened at Comic-Con. If there were any, I don't know. Sometimes there's big deals that are announced, etc. I don't know that there were any. There was a big rumor right before Comic-Con, because Peter Jackson was going to be there, uh -huh. that he was going to announce who's playing Bilbo and, okay. and uh, in the uh, sort of Shannara movie, I think, is what he's <laughs> doing. But like Elijah Wood was there and, and Peter Jackson was there and nobody said anything about The Hobbit. Huh. What cool things did you experience while you were at uh, Comic-Con? <clears throat> Very little cool. It's San Diego. It's right by the Mexican border. And uh, lots and lots and lots of very sweaty, fat people jammed into an area that's not built for a lot of people. And, uh, well, boy. at least I didn't come, so there's one less sweaty, fat guy to stink up the place. Was it, was it less fun? I mean, you went by yourself, right? I did. I did get to hang out with my friends uh, one day, which uh -huh. was nice. But yeah, for the most part, it was just me uh, flying solo. Did Jam that make it less enjoyable for you? or I think it did. Uh, part of the experience is sharing, wow, check that out with somebody else or, you know, see that costume or, oh, do you believe this line or, wow, could it be any hotter? Or, or could she be any hotter, that girl playing Emma Frost? Yeah, these are things that are better shared. Sometimes, I, I've gone with a couple of people to Comic-Con, mostly you, though. And when you're with somebody else, somebody can stand in the line for you while right. you go to the bathroom. 
somebody can get in the line right now while you go to a panel that you want to go to and then you switch later. I think that's something that we did. Um, but being on my own was rough and it just felt like the thing was more disorganized than before. Really? Usually in the past, Saturday is the nightmare day right. where they say, you know what, don't even go on the floor on Saturday. But it wasn't any different than the rest of the days. <laughs> and it's because, again, like last year, they don't sell Saturday passes. But for some reason, just all the days were, were the same. Now, huh? See, the, the problem that I found last year was there were like five or ten things that I really wanted to see while I was there. I wanted to see these panels about these certain things. And those were all on Saturday, most of them going simultaneously. And they were also all in rooms smaller than the demand for it would be. And so I had to make choices. I had to say, okay, do I want this one or that one? Okay, I'll pick this one. And then I would go and wait in line for this one and never even make it into the hall. And, and so I miss both. That's an exact repeat of what I experienced. Way, huh? of, of all the things that they were doing, the two that I was most excited about were the James Cameron Avatar panel and the uh, Iron Man 2 uh -huh. panel. Were those in the gigantic room? Yeah, both or? of them were Hall H that... The Avatar panel was on Friday, and there was a True Blood signing, and I felt like felt like I had to choose. Do I want to go to the True Blood signing, or do I want to go to the thing that's number one on my list? And maybe I can do both, but experience has taught us that you, you can't. I mean, maybe if we had a big group, or five or six right, people. somebody kind of to thing. stand in line for you. So I chose not to go to the True Blood signing, but instead I just got in line for Avatar at like noon for the three o'clock show. And of uh -huh. course you're standing in the sun and all that. Right. And in the past, three hours has been enough. Yeah. I mean, it's be. ludicrous to have to wait longer than that. Or even, it's ludicrous to wait three hours for anything. Yeah, but... Anyhow, little did I know. You know where I'm going with this? i have not yet. Are you going somewhere with this? What was the panel before Avatar? What would be the absolute worst panel to be right before Avatar in the Hall H? That's right. Twilight New Moon. <laughs> yeah, I stood in that line for three hours and I didn't. You never made it in? Are there a lot of crossover fans? Twilight New Moon and Avatar? No, or? but I, I had said that, that it was disorganized. And instead of counting the empty seats like they had in the past, I remember we'd be in yeah, Hall and H they'd and they'd say, win. everybody squeeze together and raise your hand if you have an empty seat by you. Instead of doing that this year, they had security watch the exits and count the people that left. And every person that left Hall H, they would allow one more person to go in. So when I did get into Hall H, there was a whole bunch of there were, I could basically sit where I wanted. And I was so angry because not only did this happen on Friday, it happened on Saturday. I didn't get to see the Toy Story 3 oh. presentation. And I didn't get to see the Iron Man 2 presentation, which I wanted to see. And I didn't get to see Kevin Smith for the first time ever. What's weird is I didn't get into the Dollhouse panel, and nobody watched Dollhouse. Yeah. It just it was a repeat of you don't get into this, and you don't get into this, and you don't get into this. The whole weekend, I was standing in line for a panel for, for the new V. Oh, okay. And I didn't get into that. <laughs> uh, but after that was Fringe in the same room, and after that was True Blood in the same room. So I figured, well, I'll spend all day in this line, and eventually I'll get into one of those. And the guys in the line behind me were really big Lost fans. And the Lost panel in Hall H was the first thing Saturday morning uh -huh. to get into this panel. They showed up at 7 o'clock the night before with their sleeping bags, and they slept in the line. They wanted so bad to see the Lost panel. Dude, there's not even a word for how unacceptable that is, yeah. that that kind of crap should be expected of people. That is not cool. Yeah, seriously. I mean, I felt like these were cool people for having done that, but on I would positive, never do that. On dude. a positive note for that, though, those guys probably didn't have to pay for their hotel that night. Anyhow, hey, that sort of thing is really, really frustrating. Also, yeah, there were a couple of signings that were so badly organized that they could have accommodated all the people that wanted to. But because it was badly done, there were people that got turned away or people that stood in line for a long time then got nothing. That's which is something nothing you've experienced. New, though. Yeah. The signings are always that way, it seems. Because I remember the first time that we went, we stood in line for that Joss Whedon signing and moved not one inch. And then they <clears> told us all to leave because it was over. The line but... didn't move. Yeah. How does that happen? <laughs> Unless there's some guy at the front of the line with 200 books or whatever it is. <laughs> and yeah, that was one of the uh, terribly disorganized signings was the dollhouse one. And it was so badly set up that the signing started 15 minutes after the dollhouse panel ended. 
In other words, if you went to the dollhouse panel, <laughs> you could not go to the signing right. because you had to line up two or three hours ahead of the signing. And because I had been turned away already, I just went right to the line. That kind of stuff just, it doesn't need to happen. Yeah, it shouldn't. You know, I mean, people have to pay to be there. They have to pay to get there. They have to pay to stay there and have that kind of stuff happen. It really shouldn't be possible. So there wasn't a lot of cool things then. <sighs> You know, my cousin had a laundry list of things that I was supposed to buy for him. And unless you were a dealer and were in there an hour before everybody else, a lot of those things you just couldn't get. Uh huh. What was your favorite panel that you did manage to get into? The, the coolest thing that I experienced, though, I, I thought was they did the screening of Watchmen, the director's cut. Okay. I think it was Friday night. They had extra blue schlong in this one? or Yes, they did. Oh. And I believe the screening started at like 9 p.m. And the Watchmen director's cut is three hours long. And Zack Snyder showed up. He's the director. And what he was doing was a live commentary while the movie was going. And anybody who had a Blu-ray player could log on to the Blu-ray Blu Blu live website or, or however it goes. And they could chat and send him questions. And he would read the questions and, and answer them while he's doing the, cool. the commentary. And I thought, what a great idea. That alone is worth getting a Blu-ray player for. <laughs> but at the actual screening, the hundreds of people around America that were experiencing it, they didn't get to hear Zach talk. There was a lady sitting next to Zach who was typing what he was saying. And then they just saw this, a little box of text. And a lot of the text that was up on the screen that we could see that it that was going out to Blu-ray live people made no sense. Huh. Um, and uh, there was a, a laptop or some kind of internet station in the back of the theater. And if you had a question for Zach, you could just get up and go type your question. But as the night progressed, the movie is long. And by, you know, 10 o'clock, people were getting up and leaving. 10.30, a lot of people were getting up and leaving. And every time that a bunch of people would get up and leave, I would stand up and go and get closer. And by the, the last hour of the movie, I was like on the third row, oh, just wow. right there by Zach. And instead of going back, we would just shout questions out to him. <laughs> we, he would interact and all that. And of course, the poor people back home, the moderator or whatever you want to call it, her, didn't type our questions. She just typed the answers. And so I really do feel bad as somebody that was like, I have no idea what he's talking about or joking about or answering. It's like, yeah, that was good. He said, and it's like, <laughs> what was good? What was the question? And all that. But that, anyway, that was really neat. And because so few people were left when it finally ended, he's working on a movie called Sucker Punch. And he had said, I brought T-shirts of Sucker Punch for everybody. But so few people were left that they basically said, you can have as many as you want huh. at the end. Well, within reason, you know, I'm sure there were scumbags that would say, I'll have a thousand. Take five boxes. But even cooler, he said, you know, hey, thanks a lot for staying all this time. I'll sign autographs for anybody who wants. Oh, cool. And so he just sat there for another, I don't know, hour and a half. After one, I just left after I finally got my autograph, my uh -huh. T-shirts. But that was really cool. And he really knew his stuff. People would ask him these ridiculously obscure questions. and Like, when a comedian is killed in the comic, the sky is red. But in the movie, the sky is blue. And he had an answer for that, not just <laughs> next, which would be the answer I would give. And he had... A reason for every change and he knew that graphic novel backward and forward it made me respect the hell out of this guy he was funny he was intelligent and it was just like wow you know i mean i didn't buy 300 i didn't buy the dawn of the dead remake or whatever but it's just like this guy is one of my favorite directors all of a sudden just from huh. the experience and from him being so personable in the whole all signing autographs for everybody kind of thing they not should, a lot though. of directors Seriously, would do that man all these people's paid all their money to be there and stuff like that and as long as they can get away with it i mean if it's the last panel of the night or something like that. And when they leave, they're going to shut the room down anyways. I'd sign autographs for all the Dune Steve fans that showed up. It doesn't take long to sign one autograph, does it? <laughs> That's something that I'd always thought about. I mean, probably anybody who wants to make a career in a creative field thinks about when I'm famous, I'm not going to be a tool. How much of your time can you devote for your fans before it becomes a problem, I guess? That reminds me, uh, Abby Hilton spent a whole podcast answering an email from some guy who had asked her a question. Yeah, some Yahoo had sent her a couple of questions, and she spent the whole time talking about it and, and addressing each point. And I don't know. I don't know if I would be able to do that. I, 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 if somebody had an interesting question that they posted in the comments section of our podcast, I, I guess we would address it on the air. But it was just, yeah, it's one of those things where like, well, I don't know if I would do that. 
Well, Abby's podcast is a little different than ours in that her story content is over for... It's over, Johnny. ...for a year or whatever until the next one comes out. So basically what she can do is answer people's questions to try and keep listeners at least checking back every now and then and seeing that she still exists. It's like the bands that, you know, they put out an album every year so that people don't forget that they exist because, you know, if you don't do an album for that long, pretty soon, your ancient history. Yeah, unless you're Jethro Tull, people do not remember you. I think with this generation, a year might be too long to wait <laughs> yeah. for albums. And stuff. But I don't know. People don't care about albums so much anymore. True. It's just singles. So you just have to have a bunch of singles that you can keep releasing. Release a single from your old album all the way up until your new album is ready. I remember I, Jewel did that. Shania Twain did that. I remember back in the 90s when I was really into music. Yeah, they had like some kind of stilted release schedule. And we get like the obscure track number 11 or whatever. <laughs> That's the longer you waited for their next album to come out. But. I think I've told you that uh, Kenneth Johnson, the guy that created V and uh, Incredible Hulk, and he just put out his email address on an audio commentary and said, if you've got any questions, just send me an email. And, and I did. And he responded. And I've sent him several and he responds, you know, within 24 hours or something, you know, within a couple of days. That's cool. And I don't know how many emails he's receiving, but it's just I don't know that I would do that. <laughs> I mean, you guys all have my email address, I would assume, if you're a listener. But it's just like, wow, that's that, that shows that he's willing to talk to fans. They, they, everybody has what they would do and what they wouldn't do. And I saw um, Christopher Lloyd at an anniversary Back to the Future screening in question and answer. And I had brought my vintage Back to the Future poster. And I said, oh, Mr. Lloyd, would you sign it? He patted my shoulder and he says, come see me after the show. And I was like, oh, OK, that's cool. And then as soon as, you know, everybody applauded at the end, he just hit he the exit. Gone. Um, but later I found out that he doesn't sign autographs for anyone. He absolutely doesn't sign autographs. Huh. But instead of being a prong about it, he said after the show. It wasn't just like no and he didn't say I don't sign autographs or whatever. You know, even though he didn't sign my autograph. It was a tactful way I thought, to wow, do the, it the guy has class. I guess it all depends on who you are and how famous you may be, you know. Uh, Kenneth Johnson, his star may have set by now. So he may not get all that many uh, people sending him emails. So if it's not that big of a deal, then why not respond to him? We don't get a lot of emails here at the Dune Steve, so when people send us one, we respond. To, uh, well, now it's time for the hate letter. <laughs> but uh, when you become Tom Cruise or some gigantic star that everybody knows and might want to ask questions of, then you just can't deal with it all. But anyways, yeah, so that was your Comic-Con experience, huh? That was the highlight of Comic-Con for me. And, you know, if you're at home listening, I pity you. Now, if you're at home listening, maybe you're like, wow, that's lame. There were interesting costumes and there were free things that I got. And I did get to go to some of the panels and I did get a couple of autographs and stuff like that. And, and, and I really enjoy the road trip aspect of it, which I think would put off some people. But I just enjoy being in a car and driving, whether it's with someone else or by myself. Just a lot of time to think, a lot of time to ruminate story ideas and I actually even thought about the podcast while I was driving. Wow. Did you not think about the podcast in your many hour trip to Canada? Um, you had to have because how much slush did you read? Yeah, I actually printed out the entire inbox of slush that we had and took it all with me and read it while I was there. I read something like 25 stories. Explain to our listener how you had time to read all those stories. Well, I was in the middle of nowhere. The town that uh, my wife grew up in, in Canada, is not considered a town. It's actually considered a village because it doesn't have enough population to be a town. So, uh, yeah, we were there two hours away from Edmonton, out near the uh, Saskatchewan border. Just farms all around, nothing going on. We went and did a few things while we were there. But for the most part, we just hung out with the family. And uh, since her family doesn't really like me, I had lots of time. So, yeah, I read... All those stories, then I used the paper that those stories were printed on to write one of my own, and then I had more time, so I used some more of that paper to write a little Flash story, because I know how much you love Flash, and so I was going to just let you read it. And then I discovered that her parents had gold TV on uh, their satellite dish, so I watched a lot of soccer games after that, and that was my vacation. Generally, when I go on vacation, we're going here and there, and we're looking at this and that, and we're always doing something. And when you're done, you spent five days in Yellowstone or something like that. But it felt like you'd been gone for a day and a half. 
But this time around, it was the exact opposite. We did nothing. I was there for two weeks, which is longer than normal as well. Felt like it was three. It was uh, it was refreshing, I guess. It was cleansing. It back. wasn't an enema is what you're saying. <laughs> yes. That's cool. I wish that I had done more writing. In a couple of the lines, I did grab my notebook and try and write. But yeah, I finished a story and I started on another one. Sometime soon when I finally get around to typing it up, because that is the uh, the worst part about it. And what I really wish is I thought ahead of time, because at first we were in Edmonton with my wife's sister, and her husband is like a technology nut. So the guy had like three laptop computers sitting around. And then we left there and got to her parents' house, and I had to write this story that I wrote by hand with a pen and paper. And I just thought, I wish I'd thought to just say, hey, can I borrow your laptop? And I could have typed the whole thing up to begin with. But now I've got that extra step of having to type it up, which can take me a long time, unfortunately, to get around to. You'll have to take a look at it and tell me if you think it sucks. I think last year at Comic-Con was the first time I told you the story idea that I wrote this year. Ah, it was that one. That was a really, really good idea. And I think I've berated you a few times for not writing it. (laughs) You may no longer berate me for that story. You can move on to the other ones that you want to berate me for. Uh, You know, I really enjoy the writing longhand Uh, in notebooks or on the back of pages like you did. (laughs) And for me, in the typing it up, I always do revisions or expansions or you know deletions and all that. So it's it's a free second draft. (laughs) Right. Just type the typing of it up. And I don't know if other people feel that way. And it would be really interesting to talk to people about second drafts and third drafts and you know how many drafts is enough and when is it done. And in the interim, while you were gone, I listened to a bunch of podcasts and I, I like I downloaded Tons of those Mer Lafferty I should be writing. Oh, cool! And uh, listen to to Abby talking about her writing and stuff like that. And it just it made me think that maybe well, you and I don't need to talk so much about writing because there are lots of podcasts <laughs> out there that are talking about it. But right. it's something I'm passionate about, something that you're passionate about, and the the listener always seems to be interested and just like, oh yeah, have you tried this? And yeah, that's cool. Well, but one thing that just infuriates me about all their their podcasts, and it's more than just those two, is they'll be like, yes, uh, in the week since my last podcast, I wrote another 48,000 words (laughs) and all that. And he's like, I I, I only wrote for five minutes on Thursday, but the rest of the time I made up for it. It just reminds me how lazy I am or or shiftless or or And you come come to record our podcast and you're like, this week I managed to wipe myself every time I use the bathroom. So... Much better than last week. I'm still better than you. Um, here's my one question for you before we finish. Last year, we came back from Comic-Con, and I complained a lot about missing stuff and, and, and the same kind of things you're complaining about this time. And you said, yeah, I noticed that the, the time before when we went to Comic-Con, we, you know, we're on the drive home, you're like, next year, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And then but this time this. around, you're not saying it that way. So after having an experience like that, are you put off from Comic-Con or will you be back again next year to, to give it another shot? I sort of equated it to childbirth, and right now it's like, hell no, I am not going to Comic-Con <laughs> next year, die. But as the months go on, you know, six months down the line or whatever, I'm going to have forgotten about a lot of the the, suckiness. The, the, the the pain and the sweat and the not getting in and the very fat people and the shoving, not being able to get somewhere, even though it's only in the next room. And, and I'll be like, oh my gosh, Dustin Diamond's going to be there. Uh, and I'll get excited again. Wow. Oh, and, and also the day that I got to hang out with people was so much better, too. So maybe uh, I should try and mark off those days for next year. So the problem with Comic-Con is it's always the exact same week that my wife, either her family is here or we are there. So it's difficult. Yeah, I don't know. In a just and, and fair world, you could say two weeks I spent in Canada <laughs> last year. But I know that that's not what we live in. Yeah. I think I hear your mama calling you, Rish. Thank you, Announcer Man. I think that's our cue. So thank you for listening. If you listened all the way through, free candy for for everyone if you did. Yay! I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And I know now why you cry. But it's something I can never do. Good night. Bye-bye. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Thank you for listening, guys.
Take two. Even though Clark was ruined, Barth... Boy, that's a long name. Which is what we did when we would get together uh, last year. We would swap the stories and then we would read them aloud to each other. We did that for the October Scary Story event. That's right. Um, Just November 1st or whenever we got together, we read each other's stories. And poor (laughs) Big was so, so tired. And Four in the morning sleep when read I was still to the going. end of the story. And uh, the second, the second, no exaggeration, <laughs> folks. The second he got to the end, he said, okay, go home. <laughs> um, but I guess I'll cut that part out. Uh, 